so today we'll be talking about a group of diagnoses that nobody in this room wants to have. And um, outside of the presenters today, probably no one even really wants to deal with treating. And that's the infectious uveitides. So uveitis due to infectious etiologies accounts for 15 to 20% of all cases in the United States. That number is higher worldwide. And at some tertiary referral centers, it's upwards of 30%. Infectious uveitis can often mimic immune-mediated causes of uveitis, and so we have to be um, intimately aware of these various clinical presentations of certain infections in order to have an appropriate um, diagnosis and timely management. I'll go back one. Dr. Palestine, my mentor at University of Colorado, used to have a saying about treating uveitis and that there's infection, there's cancer, and there's everything else. Everything else meaning inflammatory diseases, which is basically treated the same, steroids, immunosuppression, cancer, we have time to figure out, but infection is really the one that's treated um, entirely differently, and the wrong treatment can actually make it worse, such as steroids. And we know infectious uveitis can affect all different parts of the eye from front to back. This is a case of, we're all familiar with the herpetic dendritic keratitis. This is infectious scleritis due to pseudomonas after pterygium surgery. And this was an individual with recurrent anterior segment inflammation uh, that ended up being diagnosed with a, a P. acnes infection of the implantable columnar lens requiring removal of the ICL. And of course, our notorious posterior infectious uveitides. There are some diagnoses that are particularly urgent in identifying due to having rapid progression and a threat of permanent vision loss. So I'd like to call on a couple of residents if you can think of your top one or two diagnoses that you don't want to miss on call. Okay, good. Anything else? Great. Okay, so this is an ocular emergency. When a patient presents with a hypopion, of course, we don't want to just assume it's HLA B27 disease. It could be, but the most important diagnosis to rule out is infectious endophthalmitis, either post-surgical, which is the most common, or endogenous, which can be related to IV drug use or indwelling catheters, et cetera. Typically, a history can differentiate between inflammatory and infectious causes of a hypopion, but when in doubt, no one will be faulted for before performing a tap and inject. And then acute retinal necrosis or a necrotizing herpetic retinitis. This is typically from VZV or HSV. And as a reminder, this happens in otherwise healthy individuals, albeit with very bad luck. And there's a classic triad of vitritis, um, occlusive retinal vasculitis, and peripheral necrotizing retinitis. And this progresses very rapidly within days. And treatment consists of high dose systemic antivirals and often intravitreal antivirals. There's a high risk of fellow eye involvement and retinal detachment. And this is why we dilate every patient with uveitis because we don't want to miss ARN. So if you see someone with anterior segment inflammation and you don't look in the back of the eye, or if you're only looking through an undilated pupil, these lesions can start in the periphery and so you miss it. And so you think you're just dealing with anterior uveitis um, and miss this crucial diagnosis. Uh, there was a study published in 2016 that reviewed lawsuits related to uveitis in the United States, and the top diagnosis by far associated with litigation was acute retinal necrosis, with an average settlement of $750,000 if you needed some financial motivation to dilate. Some other common offenders, our old friend syphilis, which is known as the great masquerader since it can present virtually any way it pleases, but a typical case of acute syphilitic posterior placoid choreoretinopathy. We can see this large yellowish lesion in the posterior pole, and it has classic OCT findings with disruption of the ellipsoid zone and these pyramidal shaped RPE deposits, which normalize which, with treatment, which is 14 days of IV penicillin. Ocular TB, Dr. Shakur will touch on this today. Toxoplasmosis is the classic headlight in the fog, which describes a focal area of retinitis seen through the haze, um, the fog of vitritis, often next to a pigmented atrophic scar right there. And so toxoplasmosis is a parasite and seroprevalence in certain parts of the world, such as Brazil, is upwards of 
CMV retinitis. This is the more indolent cousin of acute retinal necrosis, and this happens in immunocompromised patients, historically AIDS patients, but these days we see it in patients with malignancy or those that are iatrogenically immunosuppressed. Bartonella or cat scratch disease is a gram-negative bacteria that causes this classic macular star appearance in neuroretinitis. And this is actually believed to be a self-limited disease, but most cases that are vision-threatening, we would treat with doxycycline or rifampin and addition of, of oral steroids. Fungal endolpamitis or fungal chorioretinitis can occur in immunocompromised patients, and this is a classic string of pearls finding. And then we have the, the zebras, more oddball infections of infectious uveitis, toxocariasis, which causes a peripheral granuloma with a stock to the optic nerve. West Nile virus is characterized by these targetoid lesions that occur in a linear fashion along blood vessels. Duzin, which is a diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis when we have a nematode wandering around in the subretinal space, leaving a wake of destru destruction in its path. And then sister cirrhosis. So the next time you think you're having a bad day, at least you don't have the larval form of a tapeworm in your anterior chamber. And then a whole other host of um, rare infectious diseases that typically occur in tropical climates that can affect the eye. We won't touch on those today. So how do we know what we're dealing with? Well, 90% of the work is done by taking a good history, figuring out where the patient lives, what do they do, what do they eat, um, taking a review of systems, we order blood work, and then of course taking a sample from the eye. So an AC or vitreous tap, we can send it for gram stain, culture, viral PCR, toxo PCR, now there's universal PCR, and more recently metagenomic deep sequencing. And rarely do we have to biopsy the sclera or the retina. So we have to maintain a high suspicion for infectious uveitis. If we're treating as inflammatory and the patient's not responding appropriately, we may have to reconsider our initial diagnosis and dig further or biopsy. If a patient presents with new uveitis, always dilate the patient so we don't miss ARN. And please never inject steroids into an eye with uveitis if you're unsure of the diagnosis and haven't ruled out infectious causes. So to end, we'll have a quote from our own Dr. Vitali. If you're alive, you're at risk for syphilis. Thank you, Dr. Shakur. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, this presenter view, I keep. Uh, where? Which one? Okay. All right. Um, now it's time to play the game. Which eyeball is this? For the residents. Uh, what does this look like? Mantis shrimp, right? Amazing. Can't believe you guys got this. But uh, so interesting animal. It's only four inches long. It has these modified mandibles that uh, can uh, strike a target at 1500 newtons. So it was, if it was human size, it would be able to punch through one foot of plate steel. Anyway, nonetheless, talking about TB today, nobody makes any money off TB. Um, here's a 28-year-old Haitian gentleman. Uh, he had pain, blurry vision in his left eye for three months, and he comes in. He has an unidentified retinal object in the right eye, but the left eye is the one that we want to focus on. And you can see lots of vitritis, uh, creamy discoloration of the retina, and this little um, what looks like a retinochoroidal granuloma uh, in the periphery. Um, as you would do with a unilateral inflammatory disease, often in a patient who's young and otherwise healthy, uh, we sent a large volume vitreous sample for PCR, which was negative for all comers, including mycobacterial DNA. 
His PPD, however, was uh, quite positive. His quantiferon gold was positive, and he had a good response to four drug therapy coming back to about 2040 without the addition of steroids. Here's a 54 year old uh, lady who was seen by my colleague, Dr. Patel, when he was at Cornell. Um, she was from Mexico. She's diabetic on insulin, very poorly controlled, has hypercholesterolemia, and is on Coumadin for her atrial fibrillation. She's had redness for six months, did not improve on prednisone, and referred uh, to a uveitis uh, clinic in 2015. Now, for the residents, when you see this kind of scleritis, when you see these kind of creamy placoid uh, nodules under the conjunctiva, always think about infectious scleritis, particularly if it's unilateral. Um, her quantiferin goal was positive and it was decided to treat her electively or um, empirically for um, a tuberculosis or tubercular scleritis. She was started on four drug therapy for TB, started on prednisone and, and variable doses of methotrexate. Uh, she was not terribly compliant. Her scleritis continued to progress. A sterile biopsy was done, which was entirely negative. She was on and off TB therapy for uh, a year and uh, disappeared as often these patients do. Uh, four months later, comes to the ER, hasn't been taking her meds, still taking her Coumadin, hasn't been taking her insulin, has been throwing up because she's in DKA. And uh, sure enough, she has a perforation of the globe. Um, bad news is that she can't see out of it anymore. Good news is that we get more pathology. Uh, and unfortunately, this eye was enucleated. And interestingly, um, Zeal Nielsen stains, acid fast bacillus staining was negative, but um, uh, the, the samples were sent to Dr. Rao back then in Doheny, and uh, real time PCR revealed tuberculosis. So, TB scleritis is particularly bad. Here's a six-year-old Caucasian lady first seen in 2010 with worsening eye pain and redness. A workup was negative, including um, a PPD and quantiferon gold. And she had a poor response to local and systemic steroids. And here it is again, once again, this you know, unusual looking unilateral scleritis with maybe some um, features of interstitial keratitis as well. Um, when we checked, her quantiferon gold was positive, her chest x-ray was normal. ID would still not treat as active extrapulmonary tuberculosis, and that's a whole other issue, convincing people that patients have TB, because you can't, it's hard. Um, and this progressive worsening of the scleritis, fortunately, she uh, came in with these little subconjunctival furnaceal nodules, which were biopsied and sent for PCR, and sure enough, um, mycobacterial DNA was identified. So she was started on four drug therapy, prednisone and Celsept, as often these patients need to be. And despite this, the globe perforated 10 months after perforation, presumably because of a delay in diagnosis and a delay in the initiation of treatment. So it's important to treat these quickly if possible, despite it being a fairly indolent infection. Tuberculosis is a global health problem. In 2013, there were 9 million cases with 1.5 million TB-related deaths worldwide. More in 2011, less than 2015. 1% um, to 2% of patients with... Oops, yeah, animations. 1% uh, to 2% of patients with systemic TB develop ocular disease. There's a high rate of TB amongst Endemic, in endemic areas, patients from endemic areas, HIV positive patients, immigrants, refugees, the elderly and minority populations. And out in the non-HIV cohort, the elderly have the highest rate of infection. TB can really present as anything, but you really wouldn't suspect it in a non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. Uh, but uh, you, you should suspect it in anybody from an endemic area or with certain risk factors. Um, and uh, beyond the uve uveitic manifestations of the disease, you can see tubercles on the skin of the eyelid, corneal flectenules, conjunctivitis, scleritis, and interstitial keratitis.
a classic presentation of uh, uh, choroidal tuberculosis is in fact multifocal serpiginous uh, choroiditis. So it differs from idiopathic inflammatory serpiginous choroiditis in that it often tends to be multifocal. It is still more common in men than in women. And it is considered to be an inflammatory manifestation of a posse bacterial infection. But you do have to treat TB and the inflammation associated with it. Um, it can be bilateral in some cases, although mostly unilateral. And there can be vitritis, which is what differentiates it from idiopathic inflammatory serpiginous. Here's a 62-year-old gentleman referred with worsening serpiginous after two years of prednisone and immunomodulatory therapy. And this ended up being tubercular choroiditis. And the reason for that, uh, the, what, what, what kind of stands out in this particular case is that, yes, there is that kind of helicoid uh, centrifugal migration of this lesion encompassing the macula, but there is this, uh, this peripheral uh, choroiditis that you don't often see with uh, with typical serpiginous choroiditis. Of course, you can see it with relentless placoid, but that's another story. Yeah. So according to Dr. Rao, uh, Narsing Rao, who used to be at Doheny and uh, is an expert in the United States on tuberculosis, Features suggesting tuberculosis do in, uh, include endemicity, the multifocality of lesions, unilateral lesions, uh, a vitreous or AC reaction, which you don't typically see with serpiginous, and the lesions tend to be macular uh, rather than peripapillary, and of course, a response to anti-tubercular therapy. Another feature of this disease is that in addition to the typical helicoid spread of serpiginous retinochoroidopathy, you also see these little sub-retinal choroidal granulomas um, or nodules rather, which uh, can, can point you to the diagnosis. So TB uveitis has multiple presentations and there's really no consensus thus far on classic features because there are no classical features. It can affect all the tunics of the eye. And the diagnosis can be made presumptively uh, even when there is no pulmonary or systemic disease, extra, uh, the majority of ocular TB is actually entirely extrapulmonary. The skin test can, can be useful. Um, what we perform more commonly over here is a quantiferon gold assay, although an article in CHEST in 2011 showed that there's really no superiority of one over the other, um, except in the BCG vaccinated which in this room I am, but perhaps not anybody else. 50% um, of patients with ocular TB have a normal chest X-ray, um, but 40% have a normal chest CT. You can biopsy the ocular tissue, but PCR and culture is notoriously difficult in this disease. Uh, and sometimes you just have to make the diagnosis in response to empiric treatment alone. One person who does see a lot of uh, uh, ocular tuberculosis is, uh, is Dr. Biswas in so Southern India, and he reported ocular morbidity in only 1.39% of, uh, of 1,000 patients with acute pulmonary, active pulmonary um, and extra pulmonary TB. The, he, he mentions that the definitive diagnosis is difficult, acid fast smears and tissue culture, and uh, and even PCR from ocular tissue is very difficult. So when your ID physician asks you if you can take a sample of the vitreous and uh, check for TB by PCR, you have to tell them that the chances of a positive uh, TB test are only about 30 to 40%, and that a negative test does not rule out the disease. Positive test, of course, does rule it in. So here's a... 54-year-old gentleman, as an illustration of this issue, who was noted to have vascular sheathing after cataract surgery in the left eye. His quantiferin gold DB was positive. Um, his vitreous sample was negative by uh, for TB by PCR. And uh, 
his chest x-ray was unremarkable. So ID decided to treat him uh, only for latent tuberculosis. So we started on isoniazid and prednisone. Um, and this is how his vasculitis looked right after uh, uh, when he was diagnosed after cataract surgery. But after being on steroids for six weeks, he presents with this, this acute granulomatous anterior uveitis, meaning that it wasn't latent TB. Uh, and sometimes when you have a new unilateral tubercular or suspected tubercular process, you do have to treat with four drug treatment, even if you're not sure whether it's latent or or um, um, or active extrapulmonary TB. Jim Rosenbaum, um, one of our colleagues at uh, in Oregon, uh, wrote this nice editorial, TB, to be or not TB. Um, he has a way with words, sadly. <laughs> uh, and he did a Bayesian analysis of TB testing in, in uveitis. And the positive predictive value in uh, endemic areas is obviously fairly you know, robust, but in, um, you know, in affluent Caucasian Portland, um, the positive predictive value of the uh, of the test is not not very high, and his contention was that yes, I do not test routinely for tuberculosis unless there are risk factors or if the disease is unilateral or if the disease has features that may be consistent with granulomatous disease. He sa does say that it, uh, it, it that it is important to, to rule out tuberculosis if you're going to immunosuppress a patient. So the question is, should we be testing all patients with ocular tuberculosis for TB? And, you know, in non-syndromic uveitis, so if, uh, and if you're not going to immunosuppress a patient, non-granulomatous disease, um, uh, you probably don't. But in granulomatous disease, you certainly do test when there's atypical features and when a patient comes from an endemic region, it's important to test. Do I test all comers uh, for uveitis? No. Uh, if somebody comes in with an acute an uh, anterior uveitis that looks like HLA-B27 disease, then no. Um, but if it's a posterior uveitis, and I know I'm going to immunosuppress a patient, and I know I'm going to put the patient on systemic steroids, I tend to. But ocular tuberculosis is really hard to treat. And if you don't test, then you're more likely to have a delay in diagnosis at some point. And um, therapy is really not very effective in, in delayed cases with only 40 to 70%, um, you know, a complete cure. And tuberculosis does have a very high enucleation rate of 30%. So missing the diagnosis is is kind of a big deal. So why not just plan to PPD? The largest case series in the Uni United States is only 17 patients, meaning, you know, obviously this is in the post HIV era, um, or it still exists, but the post and uh, epidemic era. Um, and this is uh, Debbie Goldstein and, uh, and Sarju Patel and Howard Tesler out of, uh, uh, UIC at the time, and they report on multiple manifestations of uh, of ocular tuberculosis, including uh, optic nerve granulomas, posterior um, uh, lesions, and multifocal uh, serpiginoid tuberculosis. And of the 17 patients that they reported on, 14 were mycobacterial. Three were non micro uh, non non tuberculous mycobacterial. Uh, three patients were white and non Hispanic. Eight of the seventeen patients were actually born in, within the United States. Uh, Twelve had a history of possible TB contacts, and five had no risk factors at all. Only half had bilateral disease. Uh, four or half had bilateral disease. You know contradicting the, the, the dogma that it can it's usually unilateral. Four had scleritis, two had granulomatous anterior uveitis, and 11 posterior. Posterior uveitis tended to be bilateral by and large. All other disease tended to be unilateral. 
86 percent have had at least one positive TB test. Um, two patients with negative screening had non uh, tuberculous mycobacteria. Less than half had positive uh, chest imaging CT scans or uh, or chest X-ray. So that does not, um, you know, a positive chest X-ray does not make a diagnosis. Um, a, a negative chest X-ray doesn't mean you don't have tuberculosis. This tends to be extra pulmonary in nature. More than half. Um, 76 had isolated ocular disease where there was no sign of active pulmonary or extra pulmonary TB elsewhere in the body. Only four patients had evidence of systemic TB. And here's the worst part. The average delay of referral to a uveitis service was almost two years. Um, and in this case, being the majority being Caucasian actually worked against you, uh, where nobody suspected, um, you know, uh, a Caucasian gentleman coming in from um, in the suburbs having of having tubercular disease, and therefore they had a far far longer delay in diagnosis and a delay in referral than patients who you would traditionally think of as having tuberculosis, the HIV positive, elderly nursing home uh, refugee um, com coming from an endemic region. So those people were actually protected from a delay in diagnosis. A delay in diagnosis was associated with a negative CT of the, uh, of, of the chest. And once again, I think it's important to realize that this happens to be more likely in an extra pulmonary disease in its entirety uh, than not. Profound vision loss was associated with a delay in diagnosis. Those with profound vision loss uh, had their disease diagnosed an average of 1,260 days. An average time to disease control was 137 days. Uh, after initiation of anti-tubercular therapy with or without immunosuppression. Um, supplemental doses of steroids to control inflammation was not associated with shorter periods until control of the disease. The disease tends to relapse. I always uh, ask my ID colleagues to put the patient on at least six months of four drug therapy if tolerated, and that reduces the rate of relapse in this disease, just as it would in meningeal TB. Um, the relapse rate was, uh, a higher relapse rate was associated with the use of supplemental steroids and immunomodulatory therapy. Three eyes were enucleated. These patients tended to be patients with scleritis. So in summary, think about tuberculosis. You don't always have to test for it when it's highly unlikely. The prognosis for mycobacterial ocular disease is not great. Longer therapy is needed than you need for systemic disease, and that's something that I often communicate to my public health and infectious disease colleagues. Um, I tend to ask for, and after multiple uh, treatment failures in a number of patients, the ID, uh, my ID colleagues over here do agree usually to put patients on six months of anti-tubercular therapy for drug. There's a high risk of relapse that necessitates prolonged for drug treatment and concomitant immunosuppressive regimens may be necessary. Ocular TB is uncommon in the United States, uh, but, uh, and it only accounts for about a half a percent of referrals to tertiary care. However, it does exist and the morbidity is fairly high. It typically occurs without apparently apparent systemic disease, although of course, one to 2% of patients with systemic disease can get ocular manifestations. The absence of pulmonary TB should not delay or prevent anti-tubercular therapy. Do not listen to people who say you only need to treat for latent TB because once again, this can lead to bad outcomes. And I guess for here, consider the diagnosis of TB even in patients who are not from or who have not been to endemic countries, regardless of their race. 
Uh, Caucasians in the U.S. had a sig significant delay in diagnosis, with co which correlates with increased morbidity. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Patel, Dr. Vitali, and the photography departments at these various places. And here is a mantis shrimp breaking a sea snail with great force. Anyway, questions? Yes. Cool. And is associated with a higher rate of relapse. Why why do you why do you suggest using um you use the, concomitant the steroids to decrease the need for uh for surgery? Um steroids are associated with a lower rate of um of structural complications. So for example, if you have a patient with pan uveitis comes in with uh and it has a positive TB test, and you know this patient has TB. You start on anti-tubercular therapy, but the reason you start on steroids is to prevent uh, dense vitritis and try to quell that vitritis to decrease the rate of cyclitic membrane formation and decrease the uh, formation of epiretinal membranes and tractional retinal detachment. So yes, it does not influence the... Uh, um, the time to full control, but it does diminish uh, structural complications that can be blinding. Anything else? Yes. Wait. Like anterior uveitis with hypopion with like rifabutin treatment for these patients. And how do you kind of differentiate that between like um, so reactivation or typically you're not using rifabutin in, in in current regimens okay. for tuberculosis. You're using rifampin. Rifampin does not have the same uh, incidence of anterior uveitis that uh, rifabutin does. Okay, gotcha. um, yeah, that's a yes. It, it can be difficult, especially if you don't have a view to the back. Anybody else? All right. Uh, Dr. Karaja is going to present a case. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present a challenging case of bilateral penuveitis that we have recently seen in our clinic. 37 years old African-American woman presented with painless blurry vision in both eyes. And at that time, fundus examination, as we see here in the color pictures, showed that severe optic disc edema with hemorrhages and engorged and tortuous vessels, as well as the elevated appearance of the posterior pole in the right eye. And in the left eye, in addition to the vitreous haze, there was a disc hypremia and edema, as well as uh, multifoc multifocal choroidal lesions at the peripheral retina. Here we see the fundus autofluorescence images, and on OCT, there was a serious retinal detachment with cystoid macular edema in the right eye, and left eye showed CME and subretinal and subcoveal fluid. We also did fluorescein angiography for the patient, which showed severe disc leakage, as well as leakage from the perivasculature in the right eye. And in the left eye, less severely, but similarly, there was a disc leakage and leakage from the major arcade vessels, macular leakage and leakage from the peripheral capillaries. We also did ICG for, for the patient at that time, which showed multifocal uh, hypofluorescent lesions in both eyes, which was actually more apparent in the left eye given the serious retinal detachment of the right eye. And interestingly, normally we would expect hypofluorescent of the disc. Uh, however, in the right eye, there was an um, hyperfluorescence appearance of the disc given the severely impaired blood retinal barrier. Visual acuity was counting fingers in the right eye and 20-50 in the left eye. 
There was no cells, but one plus flare in both eyes, along with multiple posterior synechia in both eyes. In the fundus examination, there was 0.5 vitreous cells and 1.5 vitreous haze in the right eye and 0.5 plus uh, cells and 1 plus vitreous haze in the left eye. And overall, with these findings, the patient had multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, optic disc edema, and serous retinal detachment in both eyes. When we look at the background of the patient, she was actually from Central Africa. However, uh, besides that, uh, ocular and medical history was almost completely unremarkable, as well as the review of the systems. And the patient had been treated with topical difilopredinate and cyclopentolate prior to her presentation to us. So in the differential diagnosis, we considered multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, what Koenagi Harda syndrome, ocular sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, and toxocariasis. We did some blood work for the patient, which showed positive ANA and slightly elevated lysozyme levels. However, we couldn't start the patient on any treatment at that time, given the pending quantiferon levels. And uh, unfortunately, the patient was dealing with the social challenges and we couldn't reach to the patient to have this workup done. And unfortunately, 10 days later, she presented by her herself with severely decreased vision in the right eye. And at that time, there was even worse disc edema in the right eye, as well as the white ischemic appearance of the retina and uh, blood hemorrhages all over the retina in the right eye, and with similar findings in the left eye. And OCT also showed re serious retinal detachment of the right eye. So we considered combined CRAO and CRVO in the setting of severe disc edema in the right eye. Visual acuity was unfortunately NLP in the right eye, and the other findings were almost uh, similar to the initial presentation. <clears throat> At that time, we forced the patient, actually brought the patient ourselves to the lab for the quantiferon testing, which showed positive quantiferon levels. And we also did chest CT at that time, which showed no evidence for granulomatous disease in her lungs. So with these findings, we diagnosed the patient with presumed ocular tuberculosis and planned to start antituberculous therapy readily and actually admitted the patient by the infectious disease team. And also we planned additional oral prednisone after the initiation of antituberculous therapy. Regarding antituberculous therapy, the patient has been started on rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and moxifloxacin instead of etampetol, uh, given the ocular toxicity per ID team. And we also continued to topical therapy for the patient. Two weeks after the initiation of antituberculous therapy only, uh, there was unfortunately no view to the retina in the right eye. However, there was some improvement of the disc edema in the left eye, which some atrophic appearance of the choroidal lesions in the fundus examination. OCT also shows some improvement of the CME in the left eye, and visual acuity significantly improved to 2025 in the left eye. And we, at that time, we started the patient on oral prednisone, uh, 60 milligram daily with slow tapering, and also continued to topical therapy on top of the antituberculous treatment. Two weeks later, um, she, uh, she uh, showed further improvement of the disc edema and the uh, choroidal lesions, even resolution of some of those lesions, and there was an uh, almost complete resolution of CME on OCT. Visual acuity further improved to 2020 in the left eye. Unfortunately, at that time, right eye developed 360 MVI. And uh, fundus examination showed further improvement of the inflammation in the left eye. We plan to continue same treatment with further tapering of oral prednisone. And almost one month later, after the initiation of antituberculous therapy and two weeks of oral prednisone with tapering, there was a significant improvement of the disc edema in the left eye with resolution of some of those choroidal, choroiditis lesions and the atrophic appearance of the remaining ones. And OCT also showed complete resolution of CME in the left eye. And B scan at that time showed, unfortunately, tractional retinal detachment in the left right eye. Visual acuity was barely light perception in the right eye, but 2020 in the left eye, and we plan to continue the same treatment with further tapering of prednisone for the patient. 
So in conclusion, high suspicion for infectious uveitis is crucial and it should be first to rule out with the patients with ocular, inflammatory, ocular inflammation. And patient history and the background is very helpful in diagnose, in, for the diagnosis of these patients. And in addition, infiltrative versus inflammatory appearance of the disc edema may be also helpful for the differential diagnosis, especially with the patients with severe and aggressive course. Currently, the diagnosis of ocular tuberculosis is presumptive, and there's a recently very nice guideline, Collaborative Ocular Tuberculosis Study Group, defined the consensus criteria, especially for the management of ocular tuberculosis. And according to that, uh, in summary, suspicion for ocular tuberculosis in terms of ocular findings, along with the positive quantiferon testing, should bear an antituberculous therapy. And after the initiation of ATT, Systemic as well as the topic, topical steroids is helpful for the control of the inflammation, given the um, immune reaction to the microorganism in the pathophysiology of the disease. Thank you. I just had uh, two questions. Uh, one was, uh, the moxie being set, uh, a substitute for ethambutol. Is that something you'll commonly see with uh, TB treatment for uh, ocular specific disease? ID for some reason thinks that we shouldn't be using ethambutol in ocular disease. Uh, honestly, uh, in, in a situation like this, like, couldn't care less. <laughs> and follow up question. Um, uh, the when I think of like serious RD um, uh, things that cause it, I guess infectious etiologies is not one thing that comes uh, a high to mind. I guess you can kind of consider this as a combined inflammatory infectious uh, issue that went on with this patient, but. Is, was there any uh, particular thought process behind that and also why the tractional RD developed? Yeah, so uh, to Dr. Warner's question, th these are the structural complications that you want to avoid. Um, and this is the utility of using oral steroids over topical. Unfortunately, this patient was, uh, you know, pardon my slang, but hosed. <laughs> you know, by the time we'd seen her, she... Uh, the disease had not been identified. There was a, definitely a very a raging posterior uveitis, and she'd been treated with topical steroids for uh, two to three months. So this uh, tractional retinal detachment occurred possibly as a result of an exudative RD that then developed subretinal and preretinal uh, proliferative vitreoretinopathy. And by now, you can throw as many steroids at it, at it as you want, and it's not going to resolve because now it's a mechanical issue. Um, and the utility of doing anything surgical to this right eye is um, limited. Okay. Um, so hi everyone. I um, uh, I uh, I'll be presenting a case um that um hopefully highlights um kind of an interesting case that hopefully highlights kind of the um the diagnostics and the workup and some of the multidisciplinary kind of nature of of taking care of a different type of patient, which is infectious uh, endophthalmitis. Um, so to kind of walk through it, so this is a 54 year old man who presented with uh, vision loss in the right eye. Um, he essentially described that two days prior to presentation, he lost uh, quite a bit of sort of vision in that eye associated with some dull aching and, and redness, uh, but no pain with, um, eye movements, flashes, float, um, uh, flashing lights, um, uh, 
um, and no symptoms in the other eye. He's otherwise quite healthy. Um, he had PRK in both eyes and notably as far as uh, social history and kind of exposure. So he's a um, an, an actively practicing radiologist. He travels quite frequently um, uh, domestically uh, within the country going to conferences. So he had just spent time in Boston, um, frequently travels to California, the Midwest and so forth, um, but nothing uh, uh, essentially um, no obvious new or sort of unusual exposures in that context including new animals and, and notably um, uh, no um, high risk exposures such as IV drug use. But what, what he did note and what was quite apparent in, in talking with him in the emergency department was that he was feeling systemically unwell. Um, so 10 days prior to, to the presentation, he had described this febrile illness with, a, with fevers up to around 101, 102 arthralgias. He had watery diarrhea and he had this ongoing um, non-productive cough with some pleuritic uh, retrosternal chest pain. Um, he had seen his PCP several days prior and was prescribed oral uh, azithromycin without much change in his symptoms. His wife felt like he just seemed you know, more tired and maybe just seemed a little bit kind of more cognitively slowed compared to um, usual, just feeling unwell. So on exam, his left eye was completely normal. Um, his right eye was count fingers um, at one foot. He had uh, normal intraocular pressure, no um, relative afferent pupillary defect, and he had uh, quite significant amount of, of intraocular inflammation. So um, he had four plus cell with fibrin in his anterior chamber, as well as four plus cell with uh, quite a bit of vitreous haze. This photo is actually a couple days after presentation, showing um, the right eye, which has um, diffuse um, central vitreous haze and sort of this vitreous debris uh, beneath the optic nerve. Um, but quite impressively, he had this sort of large um, subretinal or choroidal sort of creamy yellowish elevated lesion, um, as well as two smaller similar lesions superiorly that were concerning for, for um, abscesses. And so the working kind of diagnosis or the working kind of framework for this patient is that he's a previously healthy, amino, um, presumably immunocompetent patient presenting with acute or subacute um, endogenous endophthalmitis um, with these multifocal choroidal abscesses um, in the context of a febrile illness. And so then this got, gets into kind of then the, the sort of stepwise approach to his workup. So he was actually seen and, and sent same day from an outside ophthalmologist who had done a, a tap and inject with the concern for endophthalmitis as well. And he had an injections of vancomycin, ceftazidime, and dexamethasone in that eye. Um, and then he um, kind of promptly was um, kind of uh, underwent a systemic workup, which showed first that he did, you know, consistent with his symptoms, had some type of systemic illness going on. So he had a mild leukocytosis, a white count of 12.5, and um, uh, reasonably elevated inflammatory markers with an ESR of 60 and a CRP of 12.8. 12 Other um, kind of blood testing looking for infectious, so blood cultures, urine cultures, um, signs of immunocompromised, HIV, um, looking for other atypical infections like syphilis, TB, and possible exposures like Lyme um, um, and Bartonella were all sort of sent and ended up coming back negative. So most notably kind of getting, um, kind of honing in on his symptoms with his febrile illness, the kind of first step was getting uh, additional radiographic imaging with a CT chest. Um, based on his kind of ongoing cough and retrosternal chest pain. So he ended up getting a CT chest without contrast, which described this sort of ill-defined um, mass-like collection in the subcrinal region in his, of his mediastinum with possible foci of calcification and gas. And this was done without contrast. Um, thankfully, um, uh, our, our patient also happened to be a radiologist and somehow he had ended up reviewing his scans. Um, I think I might be um, uh, paraphrasing from what I remember, but essentially he and the, the formal radiologist read recommended rechecking uh, the chest with contrast. And so the uh, repeat CT with contrast um, showed this sort of subcarinal rim enhancing um, uh, collection um, associated again with um, foci of gas and calcifications. There was a similar appearing collection in the right perihilar region. And based on this, again, there was a high concern for um, infectious etiology, um, potentially bacterial or even fungal mycobacterial, 
um, and less likely a malignancy. Um, given also, um, I think, so this was kind of um, at this point, um, uh, a concerning source of infection. There was also concern that given um, the patient's sort of multifocal abscesses in the eye, as well as um, the report from his wife that his sort of cognition just didn't seem quite normal. He ended up um, uh, undergoing an MRI brain, uh, which showed um, innumerable ring enhancing intracranial lesions, um, also suggestive of multifocal intracranial abscesses, less likely consistent with um, metastatic or neoplastic lesions. So at this point, the patient was started empirically on IV um, antimicrobial, so vancomycin and meropenem. Um, infectious disease, kind of in, in further investigation with the patient um, in, try, in you know, ensuring that this wasn't um, um, another uh, sort of non-bacterial process, um, uh, investigated for other endemic fungi, uh, so blastomycosis, histoplasma, and so forth. Um, particularly in the setting, again, of this patient's travel history. He also had spent time uh, at Bear Lake um, uh, in caves where around a lot of, uh, he said, where a lot of bats were present. All of this testing ended up coming back negative or, and the blastomycosis was thought to be sort of um, uh, a nonspecific. Um, echocardiogram was unremarkable and the aqueous tap ultimately from his eye ended up coming back uh, essentially with no growth. So then um, uh, the next step was to, to get sample. So the best source was felt to be um, uh, from the subcrinal collection. Um, and so the patient underwent an endobronchial ultrasound uh, with bronchoalveolar lavage and a needle sampling, which ended up um, growing. Uh, tissue cultures showed um, bacteria, which is uh, predominantly streptococcus anginosus as well as staphylococcus hominis, the latter, which was thought to potentially be a contaminant. All other testing, again, for fungal, mycobacterial, um, etiologies were negative. Um, but so this was the culture, but notably even the, the gram stain showed um, potentially additional organisms. So essentially um, uh, uh, a polymicrobial um, collection um, with the streptococcus anginosis, which is predominantly thought to or known to be um, an oral and GI flora. So then at this point, the question was, how did it get in the subcrinal space? And this highlighted circle here is uh, the esophagus, which is passing through that region. And so the concern was that this patient actually somehow had a, um, a leaking uh, or a perforation of his esophagus that may be um, the, the source of this um, infection. And so he ended up undergoing a, um, a contrast esophagram, which initially was read as normal, but upon further review with the radiologists um, on the case, um, uh, found that he had actually an esophageal diverticulum with a very tiny um, area of extravasation just in that, um, the mid-esophagus, just in the area, um, uh, uh, the subcrinal space of the mediastinum um, that was thought to be the source of infection. And this was ultimately thought to be, um, again, a, a susceptible area of a diverticulum and the patient reporting that he potentially had this episode of food impaction while he was feeling unwell and sick with diarrhea, nausea, and so forth. Patient then underwent um, uh, an, an upper endoscopy to look more carefully at this region, um, which again showed the, the diverticulum, um, but it appeared at this point by the time he had this test that the area had, the, the defect had closed off and there was no more actively um, uh, leaking contents from the esophagus and they did some further sampling as well. So the final diagnosis in this case was a, um, an esophageal diverticulum with perforation and leak that was complicated by a disseminated infection with mediastinal, intracranial, and choroidal abscesses. So the patient was ultimately transitioned to IV ceftriaxone and oral um, uh, fladral and metronidazole for six weeks, followed by switching that um, to oral anazolid and metronidazole for another two months. And then um, on serial imaging, so six months later, and, and um, his uh, brain MRI showed um, resolution of enhancement of all the intracranial lesions and his um, uh, mediastinal abscess had resolved. If we follow his ocular exam, so this was just several days after presentation with these sort of active looking abscesses and significant um, vitreous haze. Um, this was just um, about a, um, a, a week or a week and a half later, you can see a uh, really nice flattening and sort of more atrophic appearance of these choroidal abscesses, the three out in the periphery um, and improving vitreous haze. Um, this is the month later. And then this is um, uh, two months later, um, showing um, 
kind of resolution of the active infection and, and really nice improvement um, of, of the botrytis in this patient with improvement in vision. So just quick um, kind of kind of interesting or key points. So with endogenous endophthalmitis, most patients do have an, identifiable, an identifiable systemic infection um, and hence the need for a, a really careful um, systemic evaluation. But interestingly, um, uh, uh, not uh, a reasonable portion of pa patients will have no, sy no systemic symptoms outside of their eyes at presentation, so 20%, and over half of them will present first to an ophthalmologist for evaluation, um, kind of highlighting the importance of recognizing this and, um, and um, initiating the systemic workup. Um, the cultures from the eye aren't a hundred, you know, aren't perfect. So there's a 50 to 75 percent rate of culture positivity from the vitreous with endogenous bacterial endophthalmitis. Again, highlighting the need for um, systemic investigations to figure out um, a source and, and an etiology. The most common risk factor um, uh, in the United States for endogenous bacterial endophthalmitis is intravenous drug use, but there's many others, um, immunocompromising conditions and and um, uh, uh, and so forth. And then treatment is systemic antimicrobials, um, plus or minus intravitreals, which is what our patient received and potentially vitrectomy. Um, and this is just highlighting, um, again, the many possible sources. So the table on the left showing that um, patients um, ultimately can be found to have liver abscesses, pneumonia, endocarditis, um, it, it sources can, can come from anywhere and highlighting the need for you know, a thorough systemic evaluation um, um, and so forth. Um, that's everything. Questions? Thanks for presenting this case. Um, did this patient have any like esophageal motility conditions prior or did he complain of like regurgitation or dysphagia or like anything prior prior to this or during while you're seeing him or not that he was obviously aware of I think it ended up coming out uh, after the diagnosis was made that he had he would had issues potentially at times with like what felt like food impaction mm -hmm. or like um uh um but nothing that he sort of had ever had worked up or knew about prior. Uh -huh.